time has come for me to say welcome to Polar Forum 2022. Uh, my name is Katarina Gordfelt, uh, and I'm, I am director for the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat. And uh, we are very happy to be here in Lund. Um, special thanks to Vice Chancellor for Lund University, uh, Erik Renström and Margareta Johansson, who has made this possible today. So, thanks for for hosting us here today. So, with this, I will give the word to Vice Chancellor um, uh, Erik Renström and uh, at uh, Lund University. So, thank you very much for this uh, brief introduction. So, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here uh, very much because uh, the, the research in uh, the Arctic domain in, uh, in polar forskning uh, is famous within Lund University and I understand when I talk to you also outside in the larger world. So, uh, some a flavor of Lund, uh, you come here, this is an ordinary lecture hall not, uh, but it is actually, I, sp I spent last night here, and it is a fantastic place. If you're at a big dinner and the dinner conversation starts to uh, become a bit boring, you just look up the ceiling and you see something exciting going on. And in particular, I should say, the kitchen was uh, behind screens there, and there were lots of noises coming out, glasses, glassware falling down, and so it was big, big, big entertainment. So, but it is part of Lund University because this is Skisenas Museum, which is an art museum about the uh, the artistic process. And uh, as such, uh, we uh, we are, are the ones that are responsible for this. So Lund University in posterum uh, in Latin. So we're also famous, at least in Sweden, for having our uh, doctoral conferment ceremony partially in Latin. And well. Many ask me, when will you ever learn Swedish? Uh, but uh, as long as I have anything to say with this, I will stay with Latin. I mean, myself, I'm from, uh, from the, the area of medicine, and I only studied very small snippets of uh, Latin. But the more I learn about Latin, I love this. It's something that brings us back to our roots, and it's actually a very good language for science as well. Um, so, I could co go on talking about this. But in posterum, yeah, for the future. So, I, I would say that's probably what, uh, what signifies Lund University. There. We have, we cherish our traditions, and they are good. They are the platform for what we do. And I would say, in these days, uh, with this political turmoil, it is quite good to belong to a sector in, uh, in society that has a thousand-year tradition, academia because politicians, they at best, they have, they have theories that date some 100 or 100, 150 years back, so they are really newcomers. Uh, so we just tell them to stay away. But we will need to do that uh, repeatedly in the future. But uh, Lund University is large. <laughs> Nothing good or bad about that. That's just a matter of fact. Uh, it is very international. Where, so this you notice both uh, at the faculty and students. And uh, well, what's particular about Lund? You can't uh, come, uh, uh, get away from this. This is Mikael Eriksson. Uh, so he's the, his brains inside there uh, is what uh, was, was the idea behind Max 4. And when physicists talk about Max 4, um, they, they always end up, oh, it's the most intense beam line uh, in the world. That impresses not so much anyone else. But when I regard this, Max 4, which is very beautiful, and when synchrotron uh, irradiation has become out of fashion in a couple of hundred years, this, I see this as a perfect art venue, uh, the rounded sphere there. Uh, Max 4, together with the ESS that's under construction, just uh, slightly to the north, are, of course, um, infrastructures that we have to think a lot about uh, at Lund University. And that is important for an increasingly number of scientific areas. Uh, 
So uh, are, are you a big, uh, big customer at Max 4 these days? No. But it will come, it will come. Because as soon as you start to dig into the ground and you pick up artifacts, at some point uh, you want to send them in here in these two giant microscopes, which they are. Uh, the ones that do this, be this best at the moment, I would say, are the archaeologists. They, um, they really behave like Renaissance people. They are deeply embedded in the, their humanistic tradition, but they uh, go into physics, chemistry, and uh, all sorts of, uh, of uh, arts um, uh, when, when that's needed. And they are actually big users here and are probably the ones who understand this the most. So looking at all this from, from ESS and down towards Copenhagen, uh, we also see this as a great area of uh, where we could do lots of uh, good things together with, uh, with companies and other, other communities um, uh, that, that want to interact with us. And we have done great investments and we will do great investments in this area. So we have coined the term Lund Innovation at this which combines uh, the, the uh, quite famous EDM Science Park, the Life Science Park uh, Medicon Village, and then Science Village. That's, I mean, this is just a side note, Science Village. I, I feel this is a bit embarrassing. We should have come up with something in Latin or something. Science Village is... Uh, in Sweden, it sounds like funky, uh, out-of-the-box thinking, but in the rest of the world, not so much. Uh, but that's the way, that's what it's called now. Uh, nine faculties in four locations, and I won't go through all th of these, but uh, I would say something particular, the, the uh, brownish dot uh, the most to the north. That's something that uh, not all universities have. We have our own airfield uh, in Ljungbyhed. Uh, this is an airfield that was very much into the military sector until uh, the end of the Cold War. After that, they have had to fight to find uh, uh, relevance for their existence in the brave new world. And they are, are big in drones. They work a lot with renewable um, fuels for, uh, for air traffic. And uh, they're doing just fine. Uh, Another thing which not every university has is the Faculty of Fine and Performing Arts. For us, it's, uh, it's located in Malmö. Just actually, my workplace is normally in Malmö, uh, at that part of the Faculty of Medicine. And this is something that affects the rest of the university in various ways. Um, like what you see on, on the, this is an arts museum and we cherish culture and uh, the cultural heritage and we will make uh, more of this um, in the future. So, just one thing uh, that probably uh, may be of some interest to all. Um, some years ago, uh, the government said that they were contemplating to, uh, to set up profile areas. No one really knows what will eventually happen, and the reaction from the sector has by and large been very negative, as it normally is. But we thought about this. We talked to our Finnish colleagues who have had this for quite some time, and they were also very negative in the beginning. But these days, they see it as a good tool for, uh, for uh, renewal and for um, increasing quality in research. And from the point of Lund University, we also felt that we have faculties that are firmly rooted in their specialities and they're doing a great job. But what we do lack are structures that go in perpendicular to this and um, that can combine into true interdisciplinary high-class research. So we started a process uh, um, a year ago and lo and behold, we now have uh, just before midsummer, five profile areas were designated, and uh, they are here. Sustainable solutions, that's where you will uh, find uh, uh, Arctic research. And uh, it is, this is a very strong area at Lund University. Whatever metrics you use or, uh, or qualitative measures, you always end up on top. So we're very proud of your work, uh, Maria. 
So, ending here. Förstå, förklara, förbättra. The motto is infinitely better in, in, in Swedish than in English. Uh, this is, uh, and I, always, I frequently use it in, in speeches, so I had to do it here as well. So, the mission of Lund University is to förstå, förklara, förbättra vår värld och människors villkor. Thank you very much and a warm welcome. Thank you. Please stay, Eric. Please stay. Thank you very much, Eric, for this uh, welcome speech. And, and I'm happy that you talk so warmly about uh, arts and uh, humanities. And uh, I will hand over, present to you a gift. This is a catalog from our art exhibition at Valdemars Udde last year, oh. which uh, was based on the artist program that we have conducted uh, alongside with our research for uh, more than 30 years. So please enjoy and thanks for hosting Thank us here. Thank you so much. I mean, I must say this is truly something that I personally uh, appreciate. And uh, I have to say this, me uh, talking about arts and so, it was not planned. I had no idea about what no? the gift sh should be. So, uh, um, but it, it, it hit the right note, obviously. Mm? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, now I will just say a few words about our secretariat. The Swedish Polar Research Secretariat is a governmental agency and our mandate is to promote and coordinate, uh, coordinate Swedish polar research. Uh, we work constantly to improve the possibilities for Swedish polar researchers to conduct polar research in field. And our overall go goal is to increase the international impact of Swedish polar research. Uh, the geopolitical situation is um, now very complicated, as we all know. know. Russia's war to Ukraine is, of course, a tragedy to the Ukrainian people. And it has a large impact also on the geopolitical situation in the Arctic and therefore also on our activities uh, when it comes to planning of field expeditions and um, research collaborations and so on, which we are very sad for. For example, we have had uh, this year to postpone or cancel two expeditions with our research icebreaker. Odin, because of part of it was based either on collaboration with Russian, Russia or it was um, planned to be on Russian uh, waters. Um, we, of course, hope that the situation will be um, improved and we are happy to say that we, can, we are strengthening the collaboration with the countries that are uh, will, willing to work with us, uh, the northern countries, the European countries, and so on. And I think that Margareta will talk a bit more about uh, collaboration, how, how, it can be, how it is affected nowadays. But we will try to sustain and do our best to keep up a strong collaboration with uh, international collaboration and try to uh, facilitate research expeditions in the areas where we can go now. Um, w at uh, the Secretariat, we have a top priority now for next year, and that is to try to um, um, plan for a uh, new r heavy research icebreaker, a climate neutral icebreaker. I think it's very important that the scientific community uh, takes its part and its share uh, in bringing down the environmental and climate footprint from expeditions and from research activities. Therefore, our top priority is to try to uh, um, have decisions on governmental level on a new climate neutral heavy icebreaker that can be used for research uh, full year round. It's not easy. I don't say that we will 
be successful, but of course we must try and we continue to do that and we, that, and we have seen some signs of success. For example, last year there was a Swedish investigation called the Kransrapporten, which uh, investigated the possibilities for Sweden and the scientific basis uh, that is the, um, uh, the reason to do this if there, these parts were in place. And there was a strong um, uh, recommendation from this report that the Sweden should invest in a new climate neutral icebreaker. I say, uh, repeat, this is not easy and we will need your help. And you have already helped us a lot because Swedish polar science is among world leading. And that is the basis at all to invest in, in uh, research infrastructure in our area. The third point that I would like to make uh, now in this introduction is that uh, we are planning for make a new call for applications in 2023 within the Pula research process. And uh, this time it will be uh, directed to Antarctica. For the moment, we do not know which infrastructure that we have access to. Of course, we have our research stations at Droning Mordland, um, Vasa and Svea, uh, but we will try to find out if we can, through international collaboration, also offer more uh, infrastructure for researchers. But the plan is to have a new call, new round in the polar research process uh, with emphasis on Antarctica. Okay, there will be more information from our secretariat and what we are uh, doing and planning from my colleagues and that will be during the session after the co coffee break. But now time has come for me to present the next speaker which is Magnus Friberg from uh, the Swedish Research Council. And Magnus is senior research officer. Well, no? Whatever, call me whatever you want. Yeah, <laughs> Magnus, you are most welcome here to make a presentation from Swedish Research Council. Thank you. Welcome. Hmm. Hi, I've been given the daunting task of presenting research opportunities at the Swedish Research Council in 10 minutes. I will not do everything. So we are, we are part of 40 international research organizations providing things like Max4 and ESS, which I presented before, and also even more of national facilities. So I made a, a selection. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the new opportunities coming up. Next slide, please. Uh, or do I have a machine here? Yeah. Next. So. This talk is very briefly divided into, first I'm going to present some opportunities and then I'm going to give you a few minutes to ask questions to the research council and I will answer to the best of my abilities. Maybe I can only point you to where you can find the answer and sometimes I might be able to answer. So it said or not in this first slide. This is what we're not providing to you guys this time. This was a 10 year effort in trying to drill 50 million years of climate record in the Arctic basin. And finally, when we got together with the Polar Secretariat, they actually managed to pull this off. Uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and we have to cancel everything. This was, I think, $32 million, something, down the drain. We got some back. Mm, okay. So, unfortunately, we cannot offer this one to you. That would have been really nice with a big Swedish flag on these drill ships. Mm. The next thing we're going to offer you very soon, this is called the ACECAT 3D system. We are building 30,000 antennas in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. We are all linked together uh, that can measure at the same time. So we will see everything in the atmosphere from about 300 meters up in three-dimensional vectors every thousand seconds and to as far as you can rem uh, consider it. So everything orbiting in space, Christoph Fuglsang's wrench, we will be able to detect it in three dimensions. But we'll also, the polar vortex, the, the high altitude winds, the noctilucent clouds, everything, we can map them instantly, hmm? constantly. Hmm? That's going to be a pretty cool thing if we can pay electric bills. So things have arrived late because of COVID in Norway, lockdown, and then when Norway opened up, Shanghai lockdown, so we couldn't get our things out. But now they're on, on site and being put together, and hopefully next year. Mm -hmm. 
Next one, this is little my new favorite project, leaving the old project behind. Uh, so, communications from Europe to Asia goes through China, Russia, Belarus, or through the Mediterranean, Egypt, uh, Burma, or different places. Not very funny. They can listen to what we say. The other route is across the United States, and we pay a hell of a lot because Facebook and Google are those cables, and they charge Europeans a lot. We want to put a new cable directly from Kirkenas to Tokyo. Mm. We have two routes. We're going to probably try to do both. One going around Greenland, which is a longer route, and then one where we need help from Katarina and her new beautiful ship straight from Kirkenas, slightly left of the North Pole to avoid the Russian sector, and then all the way to Tokyo or even to Seoul in Korea. This is a cool opportunity. So this is mostly for communications. So you, have, you, you divide these into 18 fiber pairs. 14 we will give to industry. Two we will give to organizations like SUNET for just communication between universities. This, the next two ones are the ones I wouldn't talk about. You can put sensors on these cables, really cool cells. So you can measure temperature, pressure, uh, acoustics, seismics. And we're gonna, we can want to put those regularly on the cable all the way across the ocean basin and to the other side. And that's where we need your help. What do you want to measure on the seafloor from Kirkenes until Bering Strait? So any ideas what you can do or whatever? You will have limited power. You will have very good internet connection. So you will have instant measurements. The second it's measured, it will be in your computer. But you have to have low power sensors. And we have, some are already developed. The thing is, you have to build everything at once. The cable is in one piece. So you have 100 mil. What's that? 1,000 kilometers <laughs> yeah, of cable on the ship, and you have to pull it all in once. So we cannot do any changes on route. Mm -hmm. But to do that one, also, we need a lot of icebreaking expeditions to map out the seafloor. So who's interested in that? Maybe. Mm -hmm. So these are the three things which are happening and not happening from the Research Council at the moment. Mm -hmm. Our interest for you. This will take a few years before the cable is there. And then finally, I got probably get time for a few questions, and you don't have to be about this. Whatever you want to know, uh, or thoughts of what we have done wrong, or we could do better. Two minutes, please. Mm. Time for questions. Mm. Mm. Ah, we're doing a perfect job. Thank you. Oh, oh, <laughs> but maybe I can spell some mm. questions. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to elaborate this? Um, uh, why has not this cable been, uh, I know the answer, but I mm. would like to everybody to hear this mm. once more. Why is this uh, cable not already there at the sea floor from uh, uh, over the, uh, on, the, on the North Pole, the green line? Yeah, because we need a new icebreaker which is big enough that can carry the cable across. Yeah. yeah. So, so we will we, we have to hand, build hand so in hand. Yeah. And yeah. the small cost of the cable is a new icebreaker. Yes, mm. yes, that's good. So, uh, we, we, we also actually going to need Odin as well. It's not sufficient with only one. No, mm. she can do the ice management mm. around the, uh, the new platform. Mm. That sounds great. Mm. Okay, no more questions mm. to, uh, to Magnus. Then uh, I know that you have in your um, before career been a successful polar researcher in field. Mm. Yes, and now you're doing... The successful so part there was maybe not... Yeah, yeah okay, <laughs> but you have been a researcher in field. Yes. So I know that you have a heart for field work and mm. so on. So maybe that you will... Um, have a hat. Mm. Yes, uh, come back to field work, or otherwise you can use this in Stockholm. Yeah. yeah. Please, this is a Thank you. Polar Research Secretary Thank you very much. gift mm -hmm. for you. Thank you, Magnus. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay, next presenter is uh, Katarina Bur, Senior Research Officer at Formas, and Katarina is on um, uh, Zoom. So I think we have uh, Katarina on the screen behind me. So. Can you hear me? I'm here, Katarina. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I cannot see you. I was told that I will also see you on, on the screen here. 
We hear you, Katarina, but we don't see you yet. Here you are. Okay. I was told to not look up because then I have my back to the audience, but now you appear also here. So, hello Katarina. Um, welcome to Polar Forum here in Lund. And uh, I now give the word to you to make your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Katarina. I wish I had the same name. Uh, yes. I'm Kat uh, Katarina Bur. Uh, I'm joining you from Stockholm, where we actually just had our first snowfall, so it was a really nice walk today to, to the office. Uh, I will talk to you now uh, a bit about uh, FORMAS and the funding opportunities that, uh, that you uh, hopefully can see um, uh, at us. Um, we are also a governmental research council, uh, just like the Swedish research council that uh, Magnus just uh, represented, but we focus particularly on sustainable development. And uh, as such, of course, polar research is, uh, we, we recognize the importance of uh, polar research. And uh, today I want to talk about how we can contribute. Uh, I also want to show you some of our prioritized areas of research. And uh, finally talk about two uh, forthcoming calls for proposals that we will open uh, early next year. And hopefully I, I can also say, save some time for questions. So just a few words about how formats can contribute to polar research. Uh, the research that we fund should be both of high scientific quality and societal value. Uh, less known is that we also fund innovation to some extent. We prefer we perform research reviews ourselves. We have a group of people that uh, do this in the environmental area, but we also initiate research reviews that other people do. Of course, we take part in dialogue and collaboration in, in various ways, but we also make quite a lot of effort in communicating research and research results. And for those of you who are not that familiar with us, we our three areas of responsibility is the environment, agricultural science, and special special planning. And I'm guessing the environment is of most interest to this audience. We allocate almost two billion Swedish crowns each year, and this is a diagram that shows where the money goes. So about a third of our budget, a bit more than a third, goes out in our annual open call, which is our main instrument for research-initiated ideas. Uh, this is a call that opens uh, in the spring every year. And um, on November 23rd, we will announce who, who were funded in the annual open call this year. Another third of our budget goes out in our national research programs. And I will come back to this in a minute. And we also spend quite a lot of money on other targeted investments, international calls, and the strategic innovation programs that we do together with Vinova and the Swedish Energy Agency. So a few words about the national research programs. These are 10 year long programs uh, that are initiated by the Swedish government. There are 13 of these in Sweden. And uh, farmers run four of these. Um, they all contribute to different societal challenges. And this is the government's research instrument to meet societal challenges. We do regular calls in prioritized areas, and uh, by prioritized areas, I also want to stress that this is not something that FORMAS has uh, come up with. Uh, we have, and I know the other research programs as well, they do extensive dialogue with different stakeholders to identify, identify prioritized areas, together with researchers, but also uh, societal actors and other research funders, for example. We spend uh, quite a lot of time on coordination between funders to identify gaps and overlaps in uh, different calls. We 
seek synergies with the international research funding, especially Horizon Europe, but not only, I should say. Uh, we also do quite a lot of activities to try to boost the impact of research results in society in different ways. And what's also uh, what stands out in the national research programs uh, is that we often seek interdisciplinary approaches and cross-sectoral approaches. And this means that even though uh, you may not feel at home with a certain title for a call or a thematic area for a program, uh, it still may be something that you uh, find interesting. These are FORMAS four national research programs. The biggest one is on climate. We also run programs on sustainable speci spatial planning, food, oceans and waters. And I want to say a few more, more words about the climate program and the oceans and water program, which I think will be uh, most interesting for you. The one on climate, uh, we're halfway through here, started in 2017. It's the biggest one among all 13. We allocate at least 230 million Swedish crowns each year in this program. We don't only focus on emission reductions here, but also negative emissions, climate change adaptation, and synergies with the Agenda 2030. These are the six prioritized themes in the climate program. And you will see that these are quite uh, oriented towards the societal issues, but there's definitely room for natural science here as well. Um, so for example, the ecosystems and society theme is, uh, is probably relevant for uh, polar uh, researchers. The program on oceans and waters started last year, so it's quite new. Here we allocate at least 70 million Swedish crowns a year. And here we talk about all types of water. We encourage system perspectives. We want research that uh, are both local, national, global. Uh, and we also stress here open science and participation. And here are the three prioritized themes in the oceans and water programs. It's about strengthening the resilience of the aquatic ecosystems, develop a sustainable water management, and also increase society's action for sustainable oceans and waters. And within the next few weeks, we will publish the strategic agenda for the oceans and water program. And here you can read more about these prioritized themes if you're interested. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about two future calls that we will open in January. The first one is called the links between climate change, water and biodiversity. And here we seek research projects that focus on holistic approaches to addressing all three challenges. This is a long term commitment from Formas where we uh, aim for two stages for four years each. Uh, but the call only concerns uh, the first stage. And the budget for the first stage is uh, up to 16 million Swedish crowns for one project. And we, we have reserved 120 million crowns for stage one. So the time plan is that it opens early next year, closes in March or April, and we will uh, make a decision in the fall. Another one that may be interesting for you is called Blue Innovation. This is not yet on our website, but it will be soon. Here we seek innovation projects that aim for water-related complex challenges. And here we really want cooperation between researchers and problem owners, which can be a trade association or a municipality or, or something else. These projects can last up to five years. We have not yet decided on the project budget, but we have reserved 150 million crowns for this call. And the timeline is similar to the one uh, in the previous call. 
This is my last slide. I just want to encourage you to uh, meet us digitally in February and engage in a digital matchmaking if you're interested in any of these two calls. Uh, we will here focus both on the calls, but also on the national research program on oceans and waters and the priorities that we have identified there. So here you can learn more about this. You can ask questions and hopefully also find research partners. That's all for me. So if you have any questions at all, just uh, feel free to contact me or post them up. Stay, Katarina, stay. I bring a hat until next time we meet at when I visit you at Formas. You should have a hat here from Swedish Polar Research Secretariat. Do you great, see it? Thank yeah. You. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's great, Katarina. Uh, is there any questions from the audience here uh, in the hall? No hands. Uh, Katarina, uh, can I ask you uh, one question then, perhaps? And that is, have you at Formas seen an increasing interest from the sci from sciences, uh, sci uh, researchers to um, apply for um, themes within Arctic or Antarctic or in po polar research? Well, that's a good question. Uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't think that we have followed up on that, uh, but of course, uh, you could see. I'm not familiar with that, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about our annual open call and the panel on climate, where mm -hmm. my colleagues may know a bit more about this. Yeah. That would be interesting to see. But I, I see that you have many call for applications that could uh, fit in both for terrestrial and um, uh, ocean-based uh, science and also uh, different disciplines in, in combination. So that is very promising. And thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. OK, we give you a hand. Thank you, Katarina. Okay, next presenter is Margareta Johansson, Associate Professor at the Department of Physical, Geography and Ecosystem Science at Lund University. Margareta, please come up here on stage. And um, again, I would like to say thank you because you are the reason for us to be here. <laughs> Actually, yeah. you are the reason. because Am you, I? <laughs> yes, you are, because you started this excellent concept of having the polar from at different universities. Oh, yeah. So I can thank you. <laughs> okay, we thank Because now I know there are many any polar research has in Lund that I wasn't aware of before. So this yes. is really brilliant. Yes, yes. this is nice to be a Resande Teatersällskap, traveling uh, theater society or whatever. Thanks well. for, for being uh, for um, letting us come here. Thank so you please, very much. Margareta. Thank you. And I even have some slides, which is brilliant. So first of all, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, yes interact transnational access. So this is what can interact do to scientists. So first of all, just to let you know that interact is now a day a oh I do have them here as well. I don't have to stretch my back. Brilliant. Thank you. So interact is a network of 69 research stations. As you can see there's a big blank space on the right hand side. There used to be 21 dots there in Russia. But unfortunately, we have to pause our collaboration with Russia at the moment. But uh, we are hoping that there will be a peaceful solution soon so that we can collaborate with Russia. We need Russia if we want to know what's going on in the Arctic, as simple as that. Yeah. Um, you can learn more about the research stations by visiting our website. And as you can see, uh, we also have a station catalog that we usually refer to as the travel guide. You know, where are you going to go next summer as the nerdy scientist? We look in the travel brochure for scientists. That's our station catalog. Uh, Katarina, who is collaborating, who is working with me here at Lund we, in Interact, has brought some of these. So there are some copies outside if you would like some. We also have the card game. Boring Friday nights, no longer. Play the Interact card games and learn all about the research stations. Are they here as well? No, but we might bring some. We are, it's not far away, so we can just go and, and get some more. You can also learn more about the research that is ongoing at the different research stations. 
uh, we have an Interact GIS where you can go and look at the different stations and the dif different disciplines. Uh, and you can also look at a research and monitoring catalog that is available, both online but also physical copies. So what can Interact do to researchers? Well, we provide access. We used to provide access to more than 50 research stations, but now from the February and onwards, it, we are down to 30 something, nine, I think, roundabout. We are not that fussy with numbers. Um, and on an annual basis, we have a call for scientists um, to come and do research at the research stations. We pay for the accommodation and the travel. We have just had a call finishing now on the 15th of November, so I hope some of you have uh, submitted applications to go to the Arctic next summer. Some, some, some nodding heads, I like that. Um, but we do have different modalities. So we have something called transnational access, and that is when we actually have the scientist that goes to the research station and do their research on their own. We also have something called remote access, and that is when we have staff at the research stations that are doing the research for the scientists. So this is, of course, a very environmental friendly concept if it is something that doesn't require, if it's rocket science and it's very specific, then of course the scientists need to go to the field themselves. But if it's a fairly simple setup, then it might be more appropriate to use this remote access and actually save the environment. And in addition, of course, during the pandemic, which we have endured for two years or more, then we have not been able to send people to the field. And this remote access has been really, really helpful and keep the work going uh, where there are staff. For example, the Arbisco station that the Polaris Secretariat that is running that has staff year round that can actually do um, some of this remote access. In addition, we have something called virtual access, and this is uh, where you can actually access the real data from, from the stations. Um, we have supported more than 400, 500 user groups um, during the years. We are now on Interact 3, and in total more than 15,000 days. That is a long time. If we would send one person in field, that would be a long time. But it's many people we have sent to the field, so they don't have to stay in the Arctic forever, which is a good thing, of course. Or maybe not. The outcome of these transnational access and sending people into the field, scientists into the field, is publications. So it ends up with good science. And so far, there are more than 200 publications that have been uh, published in high rank, highly ranked um, journals. In addition, we also have this Interact Arctic Stories of Arctic Science. It's, uh, you can see the book in the... I'm really bad at right and left, but that corner over there, whatever that is, um, and it basically, it, it describes some of the, the stories that, uh, some of the research that is, has been ongoing by the transnational access. Um, we also have an online course, and we have a user community, and one of the outcomes is the little bumblebee there. A new bumblebee species was detected at Tulik Lake in Alaska, and it was named after Interact. Bombus Interact. I mean, how many EU projects have got their own bumblebee species? We do. We do. Um, as I said, we do have this virtual access, the Interact data portal, that can be ex uh, where you can access um, data from, from the research stations. So far this year, we have had more than 4,500 users, which I think is quite good, actually, uh, from 136 countries. That's a lot of countries. It's really nice that you can, if you, even if you cannot access the Arctic yourself, you can still access the data from the Arctic. Um, we are also working on improving station management. Um, Katrina was talking about this climate neutral ship before, or sorry, maybe that was not the, defini the, the wording, but th that, that is sort of the, the, the meaning, yeah. Um, and we are doing the same. How can we try to reduce the environmental footprint from the research stations? They are often located in very remote areas where there are, they are the main polluters, if I may say. So how can we then decrease this? 
um, and of course working on risk management and safety issues and making sure that when the scientists get there, it should be as safe as possible. We are also trying to contribute to safe field work. So how can we prepare the scientists to go to the field? I have been doing field work in the Arctic for more than 20 years. And I, when I read, we have produced this field work planning handbook that you read before, and then a practical field guide that you can bring to the field. Uh, and when I read this, I thought, huh, huh, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah, da, 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 da. So then we have all the station managers like Magnus, and they bring their knowledge and wisdom and put that together into this handbooks and that is very very helpful for scientists if you go to a very remote place you don't want to end up realizing that i should have brought another piece of that or another battery because now i cannot do my thing and the supermarket is two two thousand kilometers away or whatever not a good scenario so it is very helpful and you can you can find that and then also looking for the what research station would suit your needs and your research questions, you can go to uh, an online tool and filter. And then the latest edition is an overview of Arctic permit systems. For some of you who have been doing field work in the Arctic, you know that it can be very tricky to get the right permits to 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 know what what to what to do before, etc. But anyhow. We hope that we can continue to provide access. This is an EU project, and of course EU, we hope that there will be future funding as well, so that we can continue to offer access in the Arctic to the science community. If you want to know more about us, then please visit our website. You can visit us on Facebook. Please like us. And then you will get all the information. We are on Twitter and, 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 and Instagram. And if you have any questions, then please contact me or Katarina here um, during the day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margareta. This has been twisted together. Yeah. Ah, here's one for you. Oh, this could be good to have in the field stations. Yeah. Is it? Yes, pretty, pretty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. First, are there any questions for uh, Margareta here on stage or... Um, no hands in the air? Okay, may I spell a question, which I <laughs> guess you <laughs> often get nowadays. And uh, it is a sad situation that half the Arctic is now excluded almost from the Interact project and all the research stations. Mm. Do you know how they, your Russian colleagues get along at the stations? Um, I, I think it's, it's very different conditions for different stations. Yeah. Uh, some of them are really struggling yeah. uh, to get, mm. to be able to, I mean, what they want, of course, is to continue. First of all, when, when we said we have to pause the collaboration, everyone responded, we understand. Yeah. Uh, and they were very, well, they were very understanding and uh, it feels as there are, at least no hard feeling between us. No. I mean, then no, no. the institutions, we don't mm -hmm. care about them, but no. the colleagues and what we want, we want to make data available from the Arctic. Yeah. Um, and that is something that they will continue to strive yeah. for, for this sure. That's an important uh, point. Yeah, they will, they will try to continue to strive for that, but then I'm not sure what their budget will be like. No. I mean, of course, that depends on mm. a million yeah. things, and yeah. many of them are belong to stately owned um, institutions. Mm. So, of course, but hopefully some data will be rescued and uh, I opened am up sure later that on. as yeah. much data as they can continue to mm. to gather, they will do mm. that mm. because they mm. have the same aim as mm. we do mm. to uh, mm, make data available. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margareta, for coming here and for presenting <laughs> your m most important work. Now Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next presenter will be online uh, via Zoom distance talk, and that is Sridhar Javak, a remote sensing officer from the CIOS um, uh, collaboration. CIOS, an international collaboration to create a regional observation system. Hello. 
Can you hear us, Sridhar? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Welcome to us here. So I give the word to you, please, Sridhar, present. Thank you. And uh, good morning from Svalbard. I would start with the introduction with the SIOS and also provide some recent updates and the opportunities for the scientists working in Svalbard. So those who are new, SIOS is a consortium of 28 institutions from 10 countries. It is also an observing system for the Earth system science and also a research or distributed research infrastructure in terms of observational facilities over Svalbard. So we have a mission to decrease the environmental footprint of science and also share technology, knowledge, experience, and data. How we do it? We work toward the integration of the in-situ measurements from the infrastructure and uh, integrate it with the space-based observations to fill the gaps. And how we do it and actual in reality, we have services. These are six services we provide and I would go one by one so uh, through each of them. First is data management. So we work on the fair principle, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So we have a dedicated SIOS data access point where you can access the data from the SIOS research infrastructure or Svalbard. We have remote sensing service, which I take care of. What is the remote sensing uh, service is the single point of contact for the satellite information for Svalbard. We are also the Copernicus relay, northernmost Copernicus relays, in a way that we promote the uh, European Commission satellite data sets for uh, Svalbard science. We also provide tools and product provide geospatial products. We annually host the annual SIOS online conference, which is based on Earth observation and remote sensing. The recent one was, uh, was recently concluded in October. We received around 30 abstracts and around 50 talks. In the pandemic times, we tried to fill the data gaps in in-situ measurements with the remote sensing. We have a remote sensing working group with the 30 international remote sensing experts who can help you to fill the data gaps if you, if you have missed the data series in the pandemic times. But uh, as we tend towards the normal situation, we also use this system for helping our scientists how they can complement their in-situ measurements with remote sensing. If you think that you need such kind of uh, information, you can fill the application form, which is mentioned on the slide, on the, on the down to the slide. In the pandemic times, we also provided access to the airborne research infrastructure. We have Luft Transport's Adonier aircraft, which is stationed in Longyearbyen in Svalbard. And we provided around 50 flight hours in 2020 and 21 to support around 21 projects. All the data from these flight campaigns are available with the project investigators, but eventually, according to SIOS data policy, it will be available for the whole scientific community. We also provide the access to the research infrastructure in Svalbard. We have regular calls, which is a little bit affected during the pandemic times, but we will we are hopeful to start this with the next year. And we, we can have the observational facilities catalogs on our website, which sessions are available for these access call. We also provide the logistics to the scientists, Svalbard scientists, and I would speak more on the logistics sharing notice board later. We have a dedicated training program in a way that we train the beginners uh, in the research, uh, beginners and PhD students, research technicians and scientists. Two types of training course we are uh, dedicatedly running these days is data management and annual remote sensing training course. Recently, we finished the AI for Svalbard training course, which was attended by around 25 uh, uh, participants. So, SIOS member institutions are prioritized in kind in this kind of training course. They provide uh, they will be pro provided with the one guaranteed spot for this such training courses. We also have the communication and outreach. Uh, we are available on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also subscribe our newsletter. And from the remote sensing uh, working group, we run this image of the week uh, on Twitter, where you can see the recent image, satellite image of the Svalbard. Uh, if you are interested, you can follow us on Twitter and you will get access to these kind of images. <laughs> and finally, Science optimization, which is most important part of the SIOS, it is uh, done through the 
concept of SIOS core data, which is uh, committed by the institutions for the long-term measurements in Svalbard. And we work on the optimization report, which is, uh, which is revised now. And this is what we all discuss in the Polar Night Week, which is the annual gathering of SIOS. I will speak more on the updates on this. And the most important product of SIOS is the annual state of environmental science report in Svalbard. It is called SES. And this is the authoritative source of information about the state of environment in Svalbard. This is also a way a bottoms up approach where research groups can actively influence the prioritization within SIOS. So with this uh, basic information of the SIOS, I will give you recent updates and the opportunities available for the scientists now, which are currently available. First is Polar Night Week, which, is, which will be held in Longyearbyen during the 23rd to 27th January, just a week before Arctic frontiers, and the registration is open for this. We also have the session in EGU. Uh, the deadline for submission of abstract is 10th of uh, January. This session is based on the airborne remote sensing observation in Svalbard. Recently, we had the Svalgren, Svalbard Greenland workshop in Copenhagen, and the discussion resulting from this uh, are based on sharing the information be between the SIOS and GEOS, the Greenland observing system, also uh, sharing information about the Dornier flights, and we will have the session and Svalbard Science Conference next year. SIOS collects the information of the requirement from the users. If you need some kind of remote sensing data or information or any kind of information about the remote sensing activities, please fill up our survey. We need your feedback and it, will, it let, let us help you by help, so help us to get, give your information. As I said, logistics sharing notice board here, this is the platform where you can put up your requirement if you need any logistics support in Svalbard. And in not only that, you can also put up your request. Uh, if, you, if you can help other scientists, you can put up your uh, facility on the logistics sharing notice board and the scientists can contact you so that we can share the logistics and reduce the environmental footprint. This annual SES report, now there, there are four reports now. Uh, in the first four years, we have the synthesized report, which you can go through this. This is recently published on the SIOS website. And this is, this is, the, uh, this is the important document for the upcoming calls, such as the new SIOS optimization call, which is now open for flight and measurement campaigns, infrastructure access and development, data harmonization, new technologies, and workshops. So funding available is about half to 1 million, million, million Norwegian kroner per project. And the deadline for the first round is 16th of December. If you want to know more, you can go through the website. There is a full call text on SIOS optimization call now. SIOS second means where you can work in, well, come into Longyearbyen and work for SIOS related issues. The SIOS second mint is uh, open annually and it, it can cover around one to six months of stay. We will have a NISMAC summer school in 23 for processing the observa uh, observing the climate variables, long-term series, and the essential climate variables. So please keep an eye on our website about this summer school. Horizon 2, which will be which is uh, the uh, the vessel provided by the Polish partners. This is available for the free transport of cargo and people for SIAS members two times each summer. So this is also confirmed for 2023. If you are interested to take an opportunity uh, for using this uh, research vessel. We also promote early career researchers. We have third ECR, Zuzana, who joined the remote sensing working group. This opportunity is open every year. So if you know a dedicated uh, early career researcher from your group, please promote them to apply for such positions in SIOS. And the last, uh, the most important, uh, the next webinar, SARS webinar, we will have the next week on the 25th of November, which will be on machine learning applied to the Arctic remote sensing. So with this uh, updates and opportunities, I will stop my presentation and I'm open for uh, any questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Sridhar, thank you. Impressive amount of opportunities and uh, for research in Svalbard, thanks to CEOs. Very impressive.
Are there any questions from the audience here in the hall about SIOS? No? Okay, uh, let me spell one question to you, Shedar. Uh, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but what are the, uh, what would you say are the uh, greatest challenges to SIOS uh, for you? Yeah, I think uh, there are multiple challenges. Uh, first, now in the past two years, because of the pandemic, most of the scientists couldn't reach Svalbard, and those were the challenging times. And there, there we tried to develop new services to help the Svalbard scientists, and we are now we are going towards the normal situation. This was the, one of the most important challenges we faced in past years. Mm. Thank you very much. We will do our best to spread the information about SIOS from, from our side here in Sweden. And it's great to be in contact with you. So say hello to Svalbard from me. Thank you. Thank you for today. Bye-bye, Sridhar. <laughs>